in math textbooks, there is often a, a tendency to review, especially at the beginning of a textbook, i.e. at the beginning of a new school year. So, grade 8, chapter 1 is pretty much a review. So, problem solving. Well, you figure out what the problem is trying to say and what it's telling you and what it's asking. And you make a plan to solve the problem and maybe make an estimate of the solution if it's not extremely straightforward. Uh, you so actually enact your plan, i.e. you solve the problem, and then you check. You check whether your solution is reasonable, and ideally you would plug it back into the original thing you started with and see if it works. Now let's say we have a recent study that says one out of every 10 people is left-handed. If there are 172 people in the 8th grade, predict the number of students who are left-handed. Well, 172 times 110 equals 17.2 expected. However, since it's kind of hard to have 0.2 of a left-handed person, uh, as that means the statement would probably be approximately 17 left-handed students are expected. Students expected. Okay. So, when we explored the problem, it's like, okay, so one-tenth of the people are left-handed. Oh, there's 172 people. Therefore, one-tenth of 172 is plan, as we solved, and we check and be like, okay, 17 is about one-tenth of 172. Wonderful. It's reasonable. So as you can see, for a lot of relatively simple problems, you don't necessarily go through all the steps. You don't have to write them out and be like, explore. Problem tells me this, and problem wants this. That sort of thing you reserve for problems where you look at it and it's like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. So, okay, the given is this, the required analysis, solve, present, grasp method is uh, another version of this problem solving method that I learned in science classes. I mean they stand for different things and solve and check are put together and solve in the grasp method and the present part, well that's mainly relevant for word problems where you're in theory supposed to give a statement. All right, suppose one bottle of Fernet is needed for every three bottles of cola to offer a choice between Fernet con cola, which is a popular drink in Argentina, or non-alcoholic cola. And if one buys 24 bottles of cola for a party, how many bottles of Fernet should he buy to offer a choice between both drinks? As in Fernet and cola, at some ratio, which can vary from mostly Fernet to mostly cola, or just cola by itself. So, he bought 24 bottles of cola. So we know 24 cola, one Fernet per three cola. Therefore, our plan is to go 24 times 1 over 3, because 1 to 3, a ratio of 1 to 3 is equal to 1 over 3. So 24 times 1 over 3 is equal to 8, and this would be bottles of Fernet. Uh, Fernet. And we look at this and be like, 
Okay, so one bottle of Fernet needed for every three bottles of cola. There's 24 bottles of cola. Eight bottles of Fernet is one third of 24. Wonderful. So that's us checking. Presenting, the statement would be he should buy eight bottles of Fernet. Now, a typical ratio, uh, besides the one-to-one -one or even mostly Fernet ones, a pretty typical ratio is something like one-third or 30%-ish Fernet to cola. So, uh, one bottle of Fernet for every three bottles of cola. Hmm. Yeah, that would leave you with, say, one extra bottle of cola for the people who are either too young to drink alcohol or are teetotalers, i.e. don't drink alcohol. Seems reasonable for a party. Alright, suppose audiobook service A has a membership fee of $4 per month and their audiobooks are $1.50 each and audiobook service B has no membership fee and their audiobooks are $2 each. How many audiobooks must be purchased within one month to make audiobook service A more economical? Service A, A is zero point five zero dollars cheaper per book, but it has a four dollar membership fee. With four point zero zero dollar membership, ship fee. So, how many audiobooks must be purchased within one month to make it economical? Well. The reason why I said with this much membership fee instead of however much more membership fee is because audiobook service fee B has no membership fee. So, 4.00 divided by 0 0.50 is equal to 8 books to break even. Even. That means the extra amount you pay for membership is compensated by the cheaper price per book at eight books. It's exactly compensated. So nine or more books makes service A. A more economical. Economical per month. So, yeah. Now let's say we have a bakery. It offers eight varieties of muffins and bakes four dozen of each kind every day. So eight times 48, four dozen is 48, four times 12, and every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, we could label what each of these terms means, but I'm just going to talk us through it because writing a lot is probably not fun for any of us here. So 8 varieties times 48 muffins each times 5 days per week times 4 weeks. So that's equal to... Uh, you know what? I don't feel like doing this for mental math. 5 times 4 is 20, but then you have a times 8, which gives you 160 times 480. 
So, 76,800 muffins. This is 8 types of muffins times 48 muffins per type per day times days per week and weeks. So the units would cancel each other out until you end up with just muffins. Yeah, so that's what ha would happen if we marked the units. Of course, we would have written it all out as A types times 48 muffins per type per day times 5 days per week times four weeks like all in one row not like not quite like this I'm just labeling things for everybody's understanding just in case find the next term in 2 6 18 54 162 okay 2 to 6 that's a plus 4 6 to 18 is a plus 12 no it's not addition then probably so 2 to 6 is a times 3, 6 to 18 is a times 3, 18 to 54 is a times 3, and 54 to 162 is a times 3. So pattern is times 3 for each subsequent and term. So next term. Next is one sixty two times three, which is equal to four hundred and eighty six. Okay, let's say somebody is typing. A 500 word report for science class. 500 words. Uh, in my experience, if you're dealing with font 12 times New Roman single spaced, 500 words is enough to fit on one piece of paper. I mean, it depends on how spaced out your report is, but it's not that much. He knows he can type about 19 words per minute. Okay, how about how long will it take him to type his report? Well, 500 words divided by 19 words per minute gives, yeah, um, this is a very straightforward question, like we can explore just by reading the question and plan. Well, we divide the number of words in total versus the number of words you can do each minute to find the number of minutes. The solving is just calculator time. So about 26.3 minutes. I would recommend you uh, reserve no less than one hour for this assignment though because editing and checking your science reports are rather lengthy affairs. You could also have rounded this problem but that might depending on choice be counted as an estimation because 19 words per minute oh it's almost 20 so 500 divided by 20, oh, it's going to take him a bit over 25 minutes. I mean, technically that's appropriate because the question doesn't specify how many decimal places you're rounding to or how approximate your uh, estimation needs to be. It says about how long, which means it probably is an estimate. Hmm. Well, context is important and also know your local conventions for the expected number of decimal places. Anyhow, the answer we got was a bit over 25 minutes. Wonderful. It's very reasonable.
numbers and expressions. So let's use the order of operations to evaluate expressions. First, you evaluate the expressions inside grouping symbols. So, say brackets, like a plus b. Or, let's say a plus b, c equals a plus b. Therefore, c squared is, oh wait a second, as we can see, exponents also come with their own brackets, technically speaking. So, grouping symbols. Brackets, exponents, mm, like say, d to the third. And, well, actually, fractions are also grouping symbols. Because guess what, guys? A plus B over C plus D. Um, this division, yes, a fraction represents a division, but the division is prioritized before uh, other things, such as times E or whatever. So it's A plus B divided by... C plus D, this takes priority, okay? So, grouping symbols. So, grouping symbols, technically it's brackets, exponents, and fractions, but, yeah, it can be argued that due to the properties of a multiplication division, yeah, okay, fractions, we can just not bother remembering that in particular, but you end up with brackets and exponents regardless. And you multiply or divide in order from left to right after that. So after brackets and then exponents, we have multiplication slash division. Does the order of what we write these letters in matter? No, it's just from left to right. And then addition and subtraction is also from left to right. This bed mass is the uh, acronym that we had back in high school, in my time. Maybe it's changed now. I've seen some places where kids remember it using PEMDAS, like parentheses exponents, and then multiplication, division, and addition, subtraction. So it doesn't particularly matter how you remember this, just that you remember that it goes brackets with the innermost brackets first, and then exponents, and then multiplication slash division, and then addition slash subtraction. Example 1, 6 times 5, the dot product is one way to communicate multiplication. The dot and cross products are technically different when you're doing vectors, but for regular math purposes, you can use either. The reason why when I have to write on a board, I usually use cross product is because it's a lot more visible then the sort of dot I can actually draw on some boards. So 6 times 5 minus 10 divided by 2. Well, 6 times 5 is 30. And minus 10 divided by 2, we can do both of these at once because they are separated by a lower priority operator, the minus sign. So if we did them in order, we'd just end up rewriting a bit, which is kind of irritating, so no. So it's 30, for 6 times 5, and then 10 divided by 2 equals 5. So 30 minus 5 gives you 25. Now example 2. 4 times bracket 3 plus 6, so 4 times 9 plus lower priority operator here, 
I mean, you can write 2 times 11, but then on the next step, you would be multiplying both of these anyway. So, yeah, because of the lower priority operator in the middle, it's fine to do both at once. Even though they are of different priority levels, you start at the two highest priority levels and you work your way down. Like uh, brackets and exponents. And then multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. And the, hmm, I wonder what the last stage is. Probably like actually write your answer. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so you can go down from both at once as long as you don't end up going down all the way to where they meet, it's fine. Well, until they actually have to meet. So 36 plus 22 is 58. You can translate verbal phrases into numerical expressions. For example, the product of 17 and 3. Well, 17 times 3 is equal to 51. Exercises. Find the value of each expression. 7 plus 8 times 3. That's equal to 7 plus... 24, which is equal to 31. 15 minus 6 plus 9 is equal to 9 plus 9, which is equal to 18. Now 6 times 7 divided by 14 minus 2. 6 by 7 is in brackets, so we have to follow order of operations, even though we can totally do some canceling. Oh well, we can talk about the, uh, some of the properties of multiplication later. So 6 times 7, 42, divided by 14, minus 2. That gives us 3 minus 2 equals 1. 4 times 14 over 2 by 7. You can multiply first, because technically in a fraction, the numerator and denominator are both considered to be brackets. But, here we can clearly see that we can cancel out some factors, some common factors. So you end up with 2 by 2, which is 4. Yeah, as the order of operations, there are a few properties where you can sh shuffle things around a little bit. So write a numerical expression for each verbal phrase. 11 less than 20. Well, 20 is your reference point. And it's 11 less than that, therefore minus 11. 25 increased by 6. Well, that's 25 plus 6. 64 divided by 8. Well, that's 64 divided by 8. The product of 7 and 12. That's 7 times 12. Variables and expressions. An algebraic expression is a combination of variables, numbers, and at least one operation. To evaluate an algebraic expression, you have to replace the variables with numbers and follow the order of operations. For example, evaluate each expression if r is equal to 6 and s is equal to 2. Well, 8s minus 2r is, we substitute in, 8s is equal to 2, minus 2r is equal to 6, that means 16 minus 12, which is equal to 4. 
3 times r plus s is equal to 3 times r is 6 plus s, which is 2. So 3 times 8 is 24. Now, let's say we have to assign our own variables. Teams earn three points for field goals and six points for touchdowns. Assuming no other points, write an expression for a team's total points. Well, let there be F field goals. and T touchdowns. Okay then, the total points, hmm, technically I'm gonna end up writing an equation because total points equals 3F plus 6T. Find the total score if a team scored two field goals and three touchdowns. Score is equal to 3F plus 6T, which is equal to 3 times two field goals plus 6 times three touchdowns. So that's going to be 6 plus... 18, so which is equal to 24. Okay, let's evaluate some of these expressions. If x is equal to 10, y is equal to 5, and z is equal to 1. Well, we substitute in x is 10 plus z, which is 1, minus y, which is 5. So that's... 11 minus 5, which is 6. Yeah, you can simplify multiple steps at once for, say, addition and subtraction. So xy plus z. x is 10. y is 5. Plus z, which is 1. So that's going to be 50 plus 1 equals 51. All right, what about 3y plus x over 4z? Well, we also just substitute in. So 3 times y, 3 times y, which is 5, plus x, which is 10, over 4z, 4 times 1. So 3 times 5 is 15, plus 10 over 4. So 25 over 4, and if you don't want an improper fraction, i.e. you want a mixed fraction, you're going to end up with 6 and 1 quarter. Let's say we want to translate each of these phrases into an algebraic expression. Well, uh, first let's just say that... Hmm... Saying that all unknowns are x is a little bit ske sketchy because maybe your final value is x. <sighs> Let John be j inches tall. Or you could put an arrow to like John's height and be like, let this be J, inches. If you write it as long as I did here, you don't actually need an arrow pointing what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, the expression would be three inches taller than J. So J plus three. Two more than thrice a number. Let the uh, number b n okay then so it's two more than three times a number so three times a number and then two more than that the difference of 60 and a number 
let the number be n. You always have to state your variables somewhere. Difference of 60 and a number. R written in this order, that means it's 60 minus n. If it was the difference of a number and 60, it would be n minus 60. Five times the number of buses. Let there be B, B buses. Five times the number of buses would therefore just be 5B. It's a single term, but it has an operation, which means it's still an expression. Properties. In algebra, there are certain statements called properties that are true for any numbers. The commutative property of addition and the commutative property of multiplication are because when you add two things, you end up with the same sum, whether you put the first one first, or actually you can't exactly put the second one first, can you? So the order that you add these things in doesn't matter as long as you're adding the, a certain number of things. And guess what subtraction is? Subtraction is adding the negative, which means that the order you subtract in, hmm, does it matter? Yeah, it actually does. Because like 1 minus 2 is negative 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. But 2 minus 1 versus negative 1 plus 2. Is there a difference? No. So commutative property, we keep it to addition and multiplication because trying to bother with the others is too much trouble for now. The point is, for commutative property of addition, you add two numbers, either order you add them in, you get the same result. Multiplication, you multiply two numbers, Either way you multiply them, you get the same result. Like if you think of an area and it's a rectangle, well, length times width is equal to width times length. It's the same area anyway. Uh, the associative property of addition is that you can add in whatever order if you have a bunch of different terms you still end up with the same thing. Multiplication, you can multiply in or whatever order you like. As long as you have the same items multiplied together, you end up with the same thing. The additive identity property is that any number plus zero is equal to that number itself. And the multiplicative identity is that multiplying by 1 gives you the original number. The multiplicative property of 0 is that if you multiply any number by 0, you end up with 0. Okay, simplify 3 times x times 5. Or you can say that this is just going to be 3 times 5x, which is equal to 15x. But you know what 3 times 5x actually means? 3 times 5x? It means the same as if you went 3 times 5 times x. It's 15x. This is one term, but it's actually uh, 15 times x. So there is an operator involved. Exercises. Name the properties shown by each of these statements. 75 plus 2 equals 2 plus 75. This is the commutative. Commutative. Property of addition. Now what about 2 times 
bracket 7 times 4, close the bracket, equals left bracket 2 times 7, right bracket, times 4. Well, you're just changing the groupings. You're changing the associations. That's why it's called the associative property. Associative property of, in this case, multiplication. Okay. So, um, what happens if we multiply into a bracket that's like uh, A times bracket B plus C? This would be distributive property, by the way. Just in case y'all have forgotten that. Right, we should probably make a note. Distributive. Okay. 14 times 1 equals 14. This is the identity property of multiplication or multiplicative identity. Specific terms may vary slightly. Reader discretion is advised. P times 0 is 0. Well, this is the multiply by 0 property. It's generally known as multiply by zero. How about this? 6 plus left bracket 56 plus m right bracket equals left bracket 6 plus 56 right bracket plus m. Well, we have changed what each bracket contains, but these are all additions, so the order that we do them in doesn't matter. Uh, so what does the bracket do? Oh, it associates the numbers. It clusters them. It's why it's called the associative property. Associative property of addition. Okay, then. 2 times 6 is equal to 6 times 2. Hmm. This is commutative. Commutative property of multiplication. Multiplication. Okay. Now let's simplify some expressions. 24 plus x plus 6. Well, what can you do here? Oh, you can open the bracket, which leaves you with 24 plus x plus 6. There's a plus sign in front, so you don't have to change any signs in the, inside. You basically multiply the bracket by positive 1. You can think of it that way. So, 24 plus x plus 6. The order you do the additions in does not matter. So you can say that this is equal to 24 plus 6 plus x. And then, it's 30 plus x. However, convention tells us that the variable goes first. So x plus 24 plus 6, or just x plus 30. 3 times 4a. Well, that's 3 times 4 times a. Because we can open up the bracket. We can redo the bracket groupings. And this would leave us with 12a. That would be associative property of multiplication. 9 plus 12 plus C. Well, associative property of addition tells us that this would be 21 plus C, right? Because you can regroup the 9 and the 12. Yeah, um, it's also C plus 21. Because the convention is to write the variables first. 13D times 0. Well, the uh, multiply by 0 property, as it is generally known, is... I'm going to give us a zero for that. For variables and equations, an equation that contains a variable can be called an open sentence. 
when you plug in a number for the variable, you can determine whether the sentence is true or false. A value that makes a sentence true is called a solution or a root for the problem. So, this term, the open sentence thing, is not all that frequently used, but hey, now you know that it exists. There are people who use such terminology. Let's find some roots of equations, shall we? Or find the solutions. So, 25 minus p is equal to 14. Um, if we plug in 11, oh, it works. Yeah, it's 11. But, how do we actually solve this thing? Okay, we subtract 14 from both sides, and we add p to both sides. And then, we flip the sides. Put p on the left side again. And when we do that, we can also do the 25 minus 14 at the same time. p equals 11. Verbal sentences can be translated into equations and then solved. The sum of a number and 11 is 24. Find the number. So, number... Generally, the default for a number is just variable n plus 11 is equal to 24. n is therefore equal to 24 minus 11, which is 13. So the number is 13. Let's say we have to find solutions for equations from lists that are given to us. Yeah, uh... That's a pretty unsubtle, thou shalt use trial and error um, message, but it's not explicit. Like, it doesn't explicitly state that you must test out each of these possible solutions in the list. Okay, then, what do we do? Oh, there's not that much space, but there's enough space for... 29 minus 13 equals 16. Hurrah! Okay. So, b equals 16. v minus 6 equals 5. Do I actually have to write this out? I mean, it's v equals 5 plus 6. 5 plus 6 is 11. 6r is equal to 48. Therefore, r is equal to 48 divided by 6, which is 8. x divided by 5 is equal to 14. Therefore, x is equal to 14 times 5. So, that's... 70. 2n plus 1 is equal to 7, so 2n must be equal to 7 minus 1, or 6. And 2n equals 6, therefore n is equal to 6 divided by 2, so 3. 11 is equal to 3y minus 25, therefore 3y is equal to 36 y is equal to 12. Well, I mean, y equals 36 over 3 equals 12. Define the variable. Then write the equation and solve. Hmm. Note that both of these, it says a number. So, let n be a number. The product of 7 and a number is 56. 7n equals 56. n equals 56 over 7. n is therefore equal to 8. The quotient of 82 and a number is 2. Well, 82 divided by n is equal to 2. Therefore, 82 is equal to 2n. n is equal to 82 over 2. I mean, you could have just switched these right off the bat, but I don't think that's how you're generally supposed to do it in North America. So, 
you end up with n equals 41 there. Notice that, oh, right, it says the quotient of 82 and a number. That means it's 82 divided by a number. Ordered pairs and relations. In mathematics, a coordinate system is used to locate points. We can call this the Cartesian grid because uh, it said that Rene Descartes was just lying on his bed and looking at a fly crawling around the ceiling and he's like, wait, I can define its position by two coordinates. <gasps> Gets up. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the horizontal number line is called the x-axis, assuming that the variable is labeled x because you could have the t-axis, like time, and then the d-axis for distance. Okay, so the horizontal axis is usually called the x-axis, and the vertical axis is usually the y-axis. The point where the two axes intersect is the origin. The origin is point zero zero, and uh, because we labeled points with capital letters, it's capital O. Yeah. Like, if you label points, you have, say, point A, point B, point C, they're all capital letters, but capital O is reserved for the origin. An ordered pair of numbers is used to locate points in the coordinate plane. The point 4, 3 has an x-coordinate of 4 and a y-coordinate of 3. So let's graph this point on this grid we have. 4, 3. That means the horizontal coordinate is 4 and then the vertical coordinate is 3. This is where point A, which is four, coordinate 4, 3, is on the coordinate system. All right, example 2. Express the relation 0, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, 3, 5 as a table and as a graph. Then determine the domain and range. As a table, you have x values and y values. x value equals 0, y value equals 0. x value equals 2, y value equals 1. x value equals 3, y value equals 5. x value equals 4, y value equals 2. Now, let's plot them on the graph. So 0, 0 is over here. I have to use x symbols instead of just dots for points because of the equipment I have. So 2, 1, well that's horizontal coordinate 2, and then vertical 1. That's over here. If you like, you can use little dashed lines to indicate uh, if you have particularly few points, such as this example here, like you could have gone like this, just to show that, oh yes, I know that the horizontal axis, it gets to 4, and vertical, it gets to 3. You see this a lot on uh, math textbook diagrams. Anyway, that's 0, 0, this is 2, 1, 0, 0. You should always actually mark the coordinates, because, oh, it looks like 2, 1, is it though? Hmm. Well, don't assume that just because it looks like it, it is a value. 4, 2, so 4 on the horizontal and 2 on the vertical. And then 3, 5, 3 on the horizontal and 5 on the vertical. This is 3, 5. This is 4, 2. Then determine the domain and range. Now, the domain is all the x values where this relation has y values. So the domain 
is x is an element of the set 0, 2, 3, and 4. The range values are y is an element of the set 0, 1, 2, and 5. So, the range, i.e. the y values that the relation is able to possess, the range values are 0, 1, 2, and 5. We can see them here as well in the table form. If we had, say, a continuous line, like, say, a line like this, then the range would be a element of inclusive 0 up to 5. And then that would be in interval notation. But in here, we only have four points. So we just have set notation with discrete values. Now let's graph each of these points on the coordinate system. So 1 is A for 1. Hmm. Well... That would be horizontal coordinate 4, vertical coordinate 1. So we come up here. This is A. We put the final labeling until later, usually, if, we, if possible, to avoid uh, writing where we need to label something else. However, we look through this and we notice, oh, we have a 4, 5, 6. Hmm. So the 5 and 6, the 5, 2 is over here. That's D. 5, 2. I can write this label because the F, which is at 6, 4, is even further up. F, 6, 4. Otherwise, it might take some uh, experience and also make sure you do all your diagrams in pencil at least at first so that you can erase and perhaps move labels and stuff. Uh, of course, there's also the issue of mistakes. So yeah, nobody's perfect. So you'll have to use pencil at first. If you have to present it in pen, you go over it in pen after. So that's A, D, and F. Okay, B, C, and E. E is at 0, 3. So 0 on the X axis, and then 3 on the Y axis. C is at 1, 3. So that's 1 on the horizontal, and 3 on the vertical. And B is at 2, 0. So 2 on the horizontal and 0 on the vertical. So this is B, 2, 0. And E, 0, 3. And C is 1, 3. C is 1, 3. There's our six points that we had to plot on the coordinate system. Now let's express this relation, 4, 6, 0, 3, and 1, 4, so three points, as a table and a graph. Well, as a table, you have x values 0, 1, and 4. And your y values are... 3, 4, and 6, corresponding to those x values. So, for our graph, we have a point at 0 for x and 3 for y, so that's up here. We have a point at 1, 4, 
So 1 on the x-axis and 4 on the y-axis. And 4, 6. So that's 4 on the x-axis and 6 on the y. Now, the graph is just going to be these three points because we don't know what happens between those points, if anything. Nothing is said to happen between those points, so we don't make any assumptions. 0, 3, 1, 4, and 4, 6. So these are the points we labeled. Well, the points we plotted and labeled. Now, what happens if we plot a lot of points? Well, we call that a scatter plot. A scatter plot is a type of graph that shows a relationship between two sets of data that are made of, for one value, you have a corresponding value. And you may have another corresponding value. For example, let's say we have, okay, we have a bunch of people and uh, they studied for an exam. Five people studied for two hours, but they got five different scores. So on the two hour mark, on the time axis, you would end up with five different points on the score axis. Regardless, you still end up with ordered pairs on a coordinate system, and the scatter plot may show a pattern or relationship of the data, or maybe there's no relationship. It can be positive or negative relationship, or, well, it could also be a strong relationship, such as, oh look, all of these points are on a line, or it can be a weak relationship, like they're scattered all over the place, but there's a vague trend. Let's say we have Miranda's math quiz scores for the last five weeks. Make a scatter plot of the data. Week one, her score was 50. Hmm. Well, uh, this is a kind of a big graph. So, week one, her score was 50. Right between 40 and 60, there we are. One, 50. Week 2, her score was 51, I seem to remember. Yes, 51. 51. So, 2, 51. As you can see, it moved up a little bit off of the intersection of the grid lines. And then it went up to 65 on week 3. So, in other words, she got embarrassed about her previous performance and she stepped it up. Good for her. So she studied. Four, week four, we got up to 72. So a bit above 70. Four, 72. And week five, she reached 80. So, either she studied really hard, which is a good job for her, or she was really not trying very hard in the first couple of weeks, and she needed a wake-up call. Regardless, this is a good, positive trend. As in, like, good for her. Is it a positive correlation? Well, it seems, if you draw a line of best fit, it seems a trend is that as the weeks pass, her math score improves. So yes, there is a correlation here. There is a relationship. Well, let's say we have this table here, which shows the number of grams of fat per serving of particular foods and their calories per serving. These are all snack foods, so they are perhaps not the healthiest things known to man. 
Interestingly, cake, even though it has the same amount of fat as donuts, uh, manages to have less calories. Presumably because donuts contain more sugar. So here we have a scatter plot of the data in the table. Fat per serving in grams and calories per serving in, well, calories. What do the x coordinates represent and what do the y coordinates represent? Well, x coordinates are fat per serving. X coordinates. are fat per serving in grams and the y coordinates are y coordinates are calories per serving serving. Now, is there a relationship between fat and calories? Explain. Well, it seems that the more fat per serving, the more calories in a serving of the snack food. So yes, there is a relationship between fat and calories. The scatter plot shows a general trend of increased calories with increased fat. Yes, a positive correlation, as in when one increases, the other also increases. Correlation is visible. Is visible. In the scatter plot. The scatter plot. All right. So that concludes our review of past material. So that concludes this chapter. See you next chapter.